Okay, so um, it is uh, always uh, uh, a great pleasure to um, uh, come to this conference and connect. Um, but I think uh, after a few years into it, we realized that this is such a heartless work, such a relentless hard work that we need to really celebrate uh, our colleagues. And uh, of course, I, I talked about it yesterday too, that there is a path, when we glance backward, there's a path that has been set up by those who came before you. And then there is a road that we look forward to in having uh, uh, other younger uh, scholars and researchers follow what is being done here. So um, that's why I think today's, uh, uh, these three awardees that we have kind of represent the journey of Muslim Mental Health Initiative. And um, uh, it, it's, and uh, having, I'm so honored to have uh, Naja Bazi here. Uh, one of the first persons when I came to America, one of the first person I saw in media, um, really embracing her culture, her religion. I still remember uh, Naja when you opened your house after uh, po uh, after uh, post 9/11, you had opened your house for a documentary. And uh, really the candid uh, openness, that's, I think that's been my goal is that we have to be visible. We have to uh, have a voice. We have to have a play like, you know, uh, own our citizenship, own our uh, position in this great country. So thank you, Naja. And then of course, being nominated for CNN Heroes, we all were sitting on the edge of our seat. <laughs> but to me, just you being there was a great moment for all of us. And then to see your smile on a Lay's uh, chips packet, I think <laughs> that that's just completes the circle <laughs> for me. So thank you for the great work you started. And then during this journey, of course, when we started evolving, and um, uh, I met Camila. Uh, Camila came in to do uh, training, uh, first aid mental health training for their moms. And I, I met this really vibrant and uh, the grace that she carries herself and the way she dressed up. I was just so fascinated um, that I was more fascinated by how she carried herself. But then as I got familiar with her work and then, it was a proud moment when she started Islamic, uh, sorry, the Black Psychology Conference. And uh, I've always tried, I, um, I think um, my goal uh, with the conference always has been to keep it inclusive, keep it diverse. So um, how I look at Black Psychology Conference is like a, uh, a proud, uh, like, you know, a cousin or a relative conference that we are really proud of and uh, hope to continue to support. So Camila, thank you so much for being here and continuing to keep, uh, uh, keep uh, engaged with Muslim Mental Health Conference as well. And but then comes uh, my favorite Zain Shamoon, or I should say Dr. Zain Shamoon. Um, uh, so one day in my clinic, I'm working and I get a message that there is a student here to meet you. And I'm expecting, you know, a regular conventional student coming in to talk to me. And then comes this um, uh, student with such a style and panache and hair flowing all over and comes and sits across me and does not call me Dr. Abbasi and says, Hey, Farha, I would like to do some research with you. <laughs> so impressed. I was like, wow, this, this kid knows what he wants to do and will achieve what he wants to do. But then, of course, Zain became part of the Muslim Mental Health Conference family and continued to volunteer and work and continued to keep us on our toes. 
it, he is an, on any given day, the biggest critique you can have. <laughs> so, um, uh, but Zane, um, we are really proud of narrative of pain and the storytelling and how you are using it for the resiliency. And I see so many youth uh, and my own girls, they would say, oh, maybe we will attend some sessions of the conference, but we cannot miss the narratives of pain. So to me, that that's uh, uh, amazing. Uh, and I'm so, so happy to have you here today. So we can uh, open it up and uh, uh, Bumi, you, are you going to introduce Camila? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Camila Mukmin Rashad. Um, I'm going to start off with her general bio, but then I'm going to say something specifically about her. She is the founder and president of Muslim Wellness Foundation, as well as the founding co-director of the National Black Muslim COVID Co Coalition, an initiative launched in collaboration with Muslim Anti-Racism Racism Collaborative to address um, need for effective planning, preparedness, and organizing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I came to first know Camila when she was a speaker at the Muslim Wellness Found, um, Muslim, excuse me, Muslim Women's Alliance back in like March, 2017. Um, she, she was a speaker at the luncheon and I, I was already excited to meet her because I had heard about her work. I had heard about the Black Muslim Psychology Conference. I'd wanted to go. Um, and she actually said, when I told her, I had just defended my dissertation. When I told her what I did, she said, you're coming to the conference, right? I said, I, I guess I am now. <laughs> um, and what struck me about her, if you know Camila, the way that she engages in the work is so intentional, so profound, so thoughtful, but also beautiful which I think resonates from the person who she is. There was a quote on her slide. I took a picture of it and I had to find it today, which I think is a great reminder for us all. It's that self-care is a divine responsibility. And I, um, I think that that is the work that Camila puts into the community. She wants to make sure that we are cared for, that we know we are loved, that we belong and that we are worthy. And so it is such an honor to present you with an award today because you are also worthy, you are loved and you, you belong, right? You, we need you. And so I thank you for your work. Um, and I'm so excited to, to hear more about the work that you're doing. Well, thank you so much, Mumi. I, um, you know, of all the awards or recognition that, you know, many of you have already received, I'm sure you'll agree with me that it's when your community recognizes the value of your work that it, it means so much more. Um, it, it really um, affirms and supports and just, you know, encourages like this vision. Um, and I agree with, you know, Dr. Hamada, Dr. Farha, you know, starting the Muslim Mental Health Conference, um, continuing all of these years and, you know, being fortunate enough to then, you know, I see the Black Muslim Psychology Conference as, you know, the opportunity to, you know, explore a deeper dive into um, expanding what we understand as, as Muslim mental health, um, particularly in the United States. Um, so I am fortunate and just really grateful for this community of, of scholars and um, believers and community activists who have made the Muslim Mental Health Conference successful and has supported the work that we have continued to do um, as, as we move forward and, and tackle the issue um, around healing. Um, so I want to share with you something that's upcoming with the Black Muslim Psychology Conference. Um, it's our sort of we're taking a different route um, this year for 2021. And our theme is, is really understanding the Black Muslim imagination and how that relates to, to freedom, healing, and liberation. Um, and so I, I wanna share sort of, this is the first sort of preview that we're um, sort of putting out in the world and, and hope to invite everyone here also um, to participate in, in exploring what this vision could be. Um, so I'm gonna give you some visuals. Um, so our, our theme, and I think, you know, in such um, a, a 
just beautiful continuation of this theme around um, healing and restoration and what that means, um, our focus is on Black Muslim freedom dreams. Um, and it is sort of building off of the scholarship of uh, Robert and D.G. Kelly, um, who talks about, you know, what is the imagination and how do we make use of that creativity and that potential um, in order to understand ourselves, not just simply in the context of oppression, but beyond that. Um, and so we want to take a journey beyond and we want to invite you all to, to come along with us and participate in this exercise. Um, so this is what stood out to me in the reading um, that I was able to do um, around this idea of imagination and freedom dreams, but that the conditions of daily life, Robin D.G. Kelly says, of everyday oppressions of survival, not to mention the temporary pleasures accessible to most of us, render much of our imagination inert, right? How do we dream? How do we see not just simply what we're fighting against, but what we're fighting for, right? What is, when, if we woke up tomorrow and, you know, many of us clinicians, we know that miracle question, right? If all of these problems tomorrow were no longer, right? Who would we be? What community would we live in? Right? What would we sort of yearn for? What will we appreciate? And what would bring us joy? So we want to imagine sort of beyond our current circumstance as it relates to Islamophobia and white supremacy and anti-Black racism. But we want to push this question beyond that even. Um, and so we're using a process called appreciative inquiry. Um, and we want to frame our conversation with really just the challenge to imagine. Imagine the year 2041, right? It's 20 years from now, and you are thriving in a Black Muslim community, or you're thriving in the communities in which you are a member. Every believer is valued, appreciated, and cared for with compassion and respect, right? What do you love about this community, right? What are you most proud of, and what brings you joy? And so if we want to explore that further, we want to start with just acknowledging what gives life in our present, right? What are Black Muslim communities doing well? What's working, right? What has been foundational in, in, in relationship to our resilience and our ability to thrive? We wanna acknowledge and appreciate, right? What is and what is working well? And then we're gonna go a bit further and dream what might be, right? What could be the vision for the future of Black Muslim communities? What are our ideals and aspirations? And then what should be, right? What is the best plan to realize this vision using innovative and rooted strategies, our foundation in Islam, um, our identities that we are so deeply appreciative and proud of, what should be? And our final question is, what will be, right? Inshallah, we're in the year 2041. What will make this vision of our future sustainable? What will make it something that we can think back on, say, in the next 20 years with, with pride, with humility, with curiosity, and, and again, with joy. Um, so we want to invite you to join the Muslim Psychology Conference this year. Because this, ex this, this question is so expansive and is so necessary, particularly in light of the losses that we've experienced due to COVID, that we're gonna make this a fall intensive. So not simply three days of, of conversation and, and workshopping, um, but we wanna expand this to three months of really intentional and thoughtful and deep reflection and study about what are our dreams? What are our aspirations? What is the vision that we really want to take hold of in order to make this sustainable? Um, so you've gotten the very first preview of what we are we'll be exploring um, in the fall. Um, so August to November of 2021, we're going on an exploration. We're going on a journey of freedom dreams, of really looking at what it takes for us to heal, um, to feel um, comfortable in who we are, in the ordinary and the extraordinary. And it will take a collective vision for us to get there. Um, so inshallah, you will join us. Um, I hope to see all of you there. And I'm really, really excited. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cam uh, Camila. And um, it's, so this is all going to be virtual and it's going to be series of conversations. 
This will be a series of conversations. Um, we will gather together in smaller groups if, we, if and when we can. Um, many of the conversations that we will have, we want it to continue to be accessible, so making those virtual as well. Um, but we want to have these really smaller conversations and wanting to, um, to find out, right? To be curious about what are people dreaming for right, and fighting for, not simply what we're fighting against. Um, and so I, I'm excited for these smaller sort of pop-up conversations to have, um, and also for us to have a, a broader sort of collective vision that we can then um, build together. Um, again, um, you know, we are here. Uh, anyway, we can support and augment um, the initiative. Please continue to engage us. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And um, this uh, now, um, I think second, uh, I, I would like to formally now introduce Dr. Shamoon. So Dr. Zain Shamoon completed his PhD in Human Development and Family Studies in fall of 2017 at Michigan State University. And I was on his dissertation committee as well. And he did not make it easy. He had to choose the most difficult topic to work on, or I should say more sens most sensitive uh, um, topic. And we, it was domestic violence in South Asian communities. Uh, and, um, but he did with his sensitivity, the way he dealt with the um, um, topic, um, it, it was, again, such a learning experience for me. Um, uh, so thank you for that. Um, so Dr. Shamoon um, also completed a master's degree uh, in couple and family therapy in 2011. He's dedicated to the creation of spaces where people can tell their personal stories uh, on route to their own wellness. Um, and that's uh, where the narrative of pain uh, came along in 2015. He helped launch uh, the project, which is uh, a group emotional outlet of personal narrative and catharsis based in Metro Detroit and now Seattle. So he's currently, and it just amazes, touches my heart that uh, it's like seeing your you know, child grow and now uh, he is a professor of couple and family therapy at um, Antioch. I hope I'm not killing it. Antioch University, Seattle. So Zing. Welcome everyone. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vasi. I'm gonna say doctor this time. I apologize <laughs> for my 20 year old self somewhere who's in a hurry. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, but I think too often, I'm, I'm also, I mean, this is a odd way to start, but I'll say too often, um, faculty of color and specifically women of color don't get called by their credentials. So, uh, I'm going to call out my, my, my past self really quickly <laughs> first. <laughs> um, but I think, um, uh, I appreciate being here. I, you know, I don't know that I'm, um, this is sort of maybe self-deprecating, which is like the counterintuitive to the entire talk I'm about to do. But um, I don't know that I deserve to necessarily be on this panel with these two folks. Uh, but I will say that um, it is kind of like a, time goes by really fast. And uh, we, I remember, um, uh, you know, I have a lot of, I feel like uh, you said child, but I feel like I have um, like these older siblings in the mental health community that I was, you know, I was an undergrad and they were kind of already there. And now, alhamdulillah, we have so many uh, Muslim folks um, that are, you know, going into social work and counseling and, and family therapy. And, you know, we have, we've been doing the, the trainings, like, you know, this is like such a community now. And I remember back when the Muslim Mental Health Conference started um, in the late, like 2000, this is year 13, if I'm not mistaken, um, in the beginning, it was like, you know, we were at the Kellogg Center at Michigan State, and now it's, you know, we're international and all this kind of stuff. And that's a lot in part to Dr. Abbasi's um, efforts. Um, but I also, I remember being at um, like Dr. Um, Dr. Amada's house in Ann Arbor and us kind of meeting there. And, you know, um, I've been mentored by, by Dr. Halim Naeem, you know, for many years, we've been good friends. And so, you know, this is a, this is like a culmination of that as well, uh, coronation of that as well. Um, with regard to narratives of pain and storytelling as healing, you know, I, I'll just say that um, it's just been a belief of mine that 
storytelling and expression and um, sharing what's happening for us, um, that should always be inextricably part of healing. It's not something that's separate or aside. I think often from a white colonialist status quo, get your degree gaze, we kind of uh, get this buttoned up, like this is the way that you do mental health. But it's an oddity. It's an odd thing to say, by the way, I'm here are all, the, see you next week. Like, you know, and that's it. Like, and, and talk, and I'm gonna sit with you with, my, with your healing at the same time. There's a humanity to sitting with people's healing. Um, and, so, and we uh, too often um, have internalized this idea that we have to be, you know, in, like kind of internal, internalizing this sort of like hyper-masculine, like, like rich white dude sensibility of like what, what it means to sit with people while they're healing. We have our own traditions. We have our own traditions um, uh, that come from the, uh, all the diasporas that reflect Muslim communities throughout history, um, that reflect communities of color, uh, that reflect Islam and Islamic traditions about healing. Um, and they can be immersive. They can be immersive within our um, uh, professional identities, not adjacent to it, not separate from it, but immersive in it. Um, so I see my, my, my faith um, identity and my uh, you know, cultural identities and my expressive identities and my healing identities all connected. Um, I might manifest them differently depending who I'm talking with, depending what the task is at hand. All this is to say that um, we as a community suffer when we don't tell our stories. You know, we'll find our ways, we'll find our ways. If we don't get a dose of it, it's like skipping breakfast and you'll eat whatever by the time it's two o'clock. If we don't tell our stories, we'll, we'll end up gossiping about each other or something, which isn't so great. So we need a better way to tell our stories that lifts us up, that gives us and fulfills that need. And, you know, we also need our lived experiences to be honored. It would be a peculiar thing if somebody said to me, hey, you know, hey, uh, I'm dehydrated. And I was like, no, you're not. Or like, here's my favorite song. And I was like, no, that's not your favorite song. But unfortunately, we do this to each other all the time. You know, just uh, um, a couple of months ago, I was talking to a friend and their friend said that they went to therapy and they went to their therapist and they were talking about how they don't trust police. And the first thing the therapist said to them was, yeah, but don't you need them? And it's like, hold on, this person has a lived experience a legitimized experience, like, and the first thing that you're, you're doing is instead of listening to why they have that experience is you need to impose what your sensibility is. You, you, it's okay to have different experiences and different beliefs and things like that from your clients, right? But it's not okay to deny their lived experience. You know, somebody says they walked to the therapy session. No, you didn't. It doesn't make any sense. And but unfortunately, we do this to each other all the time. And the more likely it's, uh, the more somebody is disenfranchised by the world, the more used to it we are about denying their lived experience. And the more that's baked into the system in the first place. So Narratives of Pain, when we did it in 2015, it was um, intentionally counterculture. It was intentionally something different. Um, it was intentionally saying, we are going to talk about wounds directly. There are wounds that we have that um, they heal on their own. But there are other ones that you have to directly attend them, attend to them. You can't just let them sit, otherwise they'll die. And as a community, our, our soul and the way that we connect will die. If we don't tell our own stories, we allow other people to tell our stories for us. We'll continue to acquiesce next to what other people want for us. And we'll try to fit ourselves up next to what other people prescribe is how we should be, rather than embracing our own needs as a community, our own needs as people, so narratives of pain, um, it's a very simple, but you know, we don't do a hundred, we don't try to be a hundred things. We try to do two things well, is that we honor ourselves when we tell stories and we honor other people when they are speaking for themselves. And we do that well and we protect, we protect the hell out of that. We protect that so much. Um, and as elementary as that sounds, we don't always do it well. We don't always give it due attention. Um, and so, you know, the narratives of pain has always been about that. And alhamdulillah, like I've gotten to learn so much from the art therapy community um, about this work, um, uh, from my mentors who are here, um, including Dr. Abbasi, uh, including Dr. <laughs> Naeem. Um, and, um, you know, we, we continue to do it and continue to have that vessel. And, you know, I hope that it continues to be a benefit. But this is not something we created. It's something that um, it builds off the legacy of any storytelling that is protected, that is guarded. And the other thing I'll say too is as a community, when you ask people to tell stories, when you ask people to open up, 
it's not just woundedness for woundedness sake and it becomes an exoticized, exoticized thing. We also make um, uh, a sort of exoticism and an exploitation out of people's pain sometimes. This is not that. This is not that. This is people deciding I would like to get this off my chest something I would like to do for myself and we honor them <laughs> in any form that they want. We respect people's boundaries. Um, and I also think just I'm kind of going on a tangent here, but I'll say, I also think we have this idea that the more that people talk about something, that means that they're more vulnerable. Not necessarily. There are all sorts of ways that people share their stories. We have this idea that more verbal is more vulnerable. Not necessarily. Uh, if people show up, that's a story. People support someone else, that's a story. If people do something with their hands and they make something, that's a story. If people sit down with somebody, uh, that's a story. There's so many uh, ways that we can consider that. So we'll continue to honor that. One thing I, I will uh, say as well is I couldn't have done this work without the narratives folks. Um, and uh, specifically, uh, you know, you know, honestly, in my opinion, this is the person who's been the backbone um, of the like logistical side of this conference for uh, uh, the better part of half a decade, if not more, and that's, uh, 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 my brother Hamad Ali, um, and I just want to say that he is co-founded Narratives of Pain with me, and I just want to give a shout out to Hamad um, and everybody else. Uh, I don't want to favor him, although he's been with me uh, since the beginning. And you know, Alhamdulillah, at this point, I think we've done like 27 narrative shows, which is crazy. Um, and uh, I'm just really thankful to continue to be part of it, and uh, we hope to continue to do it. And um, also support any other storytelling vessel that's out there. This is not something that should be an add-on or a footnote. Storytelling um, and our lived experiences should be at the center of how we think about our healing. You don't know what somebody's needs are unless you hear them. And people deserve to be believed about what their what their what their lived experiences are, and that shouldn't be a question. So. Um, I wish it wasn't counterculture, but let's continue. I hope, and this is my call to all of you, let's continue to honor people and set good boundaries and allow people to reclaim their lived experiences. Um, I think it will help us in a lot of lot, uh, all sorts of ways. And I, I'm honored to be here um, and I am uh, appreciative and uh, inshallah, I look forward to working with, uh, with our community. Uh, Thank you so much. Yes, uh, Hamad, uh, Hamad Ali is the quintessential ingredient of Muslim Mental Health Conference. He's with the Institute, he's with the consortium, he's uh, with the narrative of pain. So uh, uh, Hamad, thank you Hamad. Appreciate your all the hard work, thank you. So now uh, last uh, but not the least, my personal Shero, my, um, who has uh, really um, was the first person who showed me how to carry yourself in public and how not to be apologetic of your beliefs or your um, culture, uh, Najabazi. And Najabazi's bio, it's so powerful, uh, empowering hope, serving humanity, celebrating diversity. Najabazi Aran is an internationally recognized healer, humanitarian, and interfaith leader who left a six-figure salary as a critical care nurse to build Zaman International. The Metro Detroit-based nonprofit um, uh, organization helps and empower marginalized women and children to break the cycle of extreme poverty. She was recognized as a top 10 CNN uh, hero, highlighting Zaman's growth from a grassroots team of volunteers to a world-class organization with a global reach that has helped more than 1.8 million in 20 countries since 2010. Uh, born and raised in Southeast Michigan, Naja earned her nursing degree from Madonna University and specialized over the past three decades, decades in critical care and transcultural nursing. The CEO of diversity specialist, Naja has uh, implemented a national model of transcultural clinical care and hosted workshop for healthcare institute across the country. It's a big bio, it's gonna be available on the, I want to give Naja uh, more time to talk about her work and about herself. But again, thank you, thank you, thank you for inspiring so many of us, Naja mm -hmm. Basi. 
Thank you, Dr. Farah. Thank you so much. And congratulations, Dr. Zain and Dr. Kamala on your uh, recognition today. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. It's, it's really an honor to be here. You know, um, I have managed uh, by the grace of God to collect all of this crystal and all these awards that I share with everyone um, that's been a part of them because they're not mine, they're ours. And, and I don't say that to be humble. It's just, you don't get anywhere on your own. It, it takes a team to get you there. But this one was extra special for me. And, you know, it, it's interesting because all of these years in clinical practice, 40 years in, in the transcultural field, um, you know, trying to break through all of these kind of ceilings um, that we have to go through as Muslims, as, a, as an Arab American, as a person whose family's been here 135 years, you know, generation after generation. And, and you know, my work began, you know, I was 21 years old and, and here I am 61 now, just about. And so it, it's been a journey. It's been really quite a journey, but why this is so special to me today is even though I've spoken at these conferences, I've spoken all around the world at these kinds of conferences, I've never been actually recognized uh, in the mental health area. And it, it's interesting because when, when this came up, I thought to myself, how beautiful, because in, in my opinion, as a clinician, nothing can happen without our mental wellness. And so um, I just wanna thank you for this because I really truly am humbled uh, by this recognition and, and I will carry it in my heart I wanna talk very briefly about a few things. Uh, I wanna talk about the succession planning because <laughs> Dr. Abbasi, you, you, you spoke about it earlier about how there are those who come first and then you know, there are, there, you know, we have strong shoulders and others stand on our shoulders and then there's the future and our work continues on and on. Um, when I first began, there was probably three nurses uh, and that was about it. And I think there was one psychiatrist at the time that people would refer to. And now here we are with this incredible community of Muslim mental health providers. You don't know how that makes me feel. It makes me feel like I'm going into my grave, hopefully, God willing, having contributed to something bigger than myself. At Zaman International, of course, we deal with trauma. We're dealing with women who are abandoned, abused, divorced, widowed. Um, who suffered extreme uh, violence, either from war or domestic or whatever it may be, living in extreme poverty at $10,000 with other subsidies or less. And so, you know, my life from 1996 till now, these past 20 plus years, almost 25 years of doing the humanitarian work has, has given me insight but what it's given me insight into is not only the pain of what we do as human beings to one another, but it's given me insight into the resilience of our humanness. And I have learned using the transcultural model in theory that when applied correctly, uh, Dr. Zane, those stories, those narratives, those, you know, being able to tell our own stories in safe, safe, safe zones, and with trusted people who are professionals who really know what they're doing, who can hold that space for us, I think has been a critical part of moving our clients from, you know, despair to resilience. But there have been, they've been my teachers because I watch what they go through and I'm amazed at the human resilience. I also want to talk about the succession planning that I just mentioned a few minutes ago. I am in succession planning. I mean, every breath I take, you know, um, in, in my line of work and end, end of life work, which I, I've done for so many years, again, 40 years in end of life work, you know, we're all terminal. And so I've been on the front lines, on grand rounds, in hospitals, in med schools, teaching this idea of communicating grief and what to do with the grief that we carry and, and how to not dismiss that grief. And I hope that some of you who are listening today will actually specialize in bereavement and grief. It's an area that I think we need some concentration on to be able to really hold those spaces for people because that is an area that I find we, we probably need to beef it up a little bit. I also want to share with you that one of my greatest honors is that my daughter Nadia 
is uh, not only a degree in peace building, studied with the Mennonites at EMU, but she actually is degreed as a marriage and family therapist. What I learned from Nadia is how important it is to be rooted in theory. And I want to share with you something from my heart, something I'm a little concerned about. And I hope that you could take this up and, and maybe, you know, really think about it. I, I, I'm a little embarrassed to admit it, but there are people out there who should not be meeting with people. And they, they just don't have the theory behind them, or, or they don't have the clinical knowledge to be able to take a person and, and sit with them and help them and, and be still and listen. And, and so I'm a little concerned about that. I'm hoping that with the more and more uh, the community grows in mental health and the more clinicians we have or clinical practice people that we have, marriage and family therapists and specialties, these subspecialties that so many of you are part of, that that will get resolved. But I, I just say that to you because I see that it's a problem and I hope it's one that we can resolve. Um, lastly, in my succession planning, I, I just want to say that one of the things I still believe is very important is in the, in the transcultural nursing model that I, I is my second skin, truly my second skin. You know, the, I, right from the, out the gate, the West had clumped culture and spirituality together and, you know, called them a cultural approach. And what I've been doing over the past 40 years is splitting that up and making sure that people understand that we have a cultural identity, call it whatever you may want to call it. You identify your own culture. We have a spiritual identity. Those are two different assessments. And in your world, you know that, but in the majority of healthcare, that's not so distinguishable. And so I think the more that we can talk and assess spiritual needs, cultural needs, our human needs, I think that, that that's an important place and I hope to leave that work behind me. Uh, lastly, in closing, I, I just wanna say that um, this decade, this next decade, I did a vision board called my decade of development. Uh, if God gives me life from 60 to 70, I really wanna focus on senior health. I want to focus on caregiving, families who are struggling to take care of their loved ones. What does it look like to be Muslim and saging instead of aging? And what does Islam give us that allows us to be saging and not just aging? And I'm so excited because I believe, I personally, I really believe that Islam is so uh, ripe for this country and that the values and morals that we carry uh, are so nurturing. And I think that's one area, in addition to grief, that we really need to focus on is the senior population and what it is the rest of this country is going to learn from amazing Muslim families who really take care and love by the commandments we have. So thank you everyone for allowing me to share a little bit of my heart with you. And uh, Dr. Abbasi, thank you so much for the award. To some of you I see are my students from some of, from Bayan Bay Claremont and Dr. Hamada, salam alaikum to you as well. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much. And please give our love to Nadia, we miss her. She was part of this initiative and participated for a few years. So we need to reconnect and bring her back. But thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Avesa. Thank you. And you so, did bring me to my next, uh, one of my next favorite Arab friend <laughs> and colleague, Dr. Hamada Hamid al Talib. I want to especially uh, thank him and Institute of Muslim Mental Health for sponsoring this uh, award segment. And uh, Dr. al Talib, if you want to add something. <laughs> you know, I would like to talk extemporaneously, but. Um... Thank you, everybody. I, you know, I'm, re I'm really happy um, that we had time to, to share and, and see old friends and uh, learn. I mean, you know, I remember Zane when he was in high school uh, uh, from East Lansing and came, come making full circle learning from him as well. And so um, thanks, everybody. And thanks, Farhan and all the organizers for keeping this alive. It's been a tough year. And so seeing through this has, has been really gratifying. All right, so. So I, in, the, in the end, I would like to add that 
um, how I have always envisioned Muslim mental health work is like we are like one big family. We do at times choose parallel paths to get to our goals, our individual goals, or how uh, we look at the community and the needs, how we assess the needs of the community. And that's how I see Camila creating her parallel path, uh, uh, Najabazi creating her parallel path, Zain finding his connection to the community through his talent. Um, I remember as a mentor, Dr. Al-Talib taught me three things. You can bring three things to the community, time, talent, or treasure. And uh, we might be walking on parallel paths, but we continue to be very aware of each other. And we are continue to support each other and collaborate going forward. And hopefully my goal is today we are a family, tomorrow we will be a mental health ummah. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for all the speakers and the presenters. Um, we are gonna take a break. Um, we've got about a 20 minute break coming up here. And then inshallah, we will move on to the next few tracks. Jazakallah khair, everyone. Thank you. See you in a minute. 